welcome all of you to my career conversations for agribusiness. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm Carrie Brown. I'm the industry council lead for agribusiness, and I will be your host today. My career conversations are a great way for schools and companies to connect and for students to learn about career possibilities that exist in West Michigan in this industry. I'm excited to introduce you today to Sarah Plug, Simon Kronk, and Zenobia Taylor Weiss, who are our career guides today for this session. A few things to go over before we get started and have our conversations with the career guides. Uh, if you have any questions today during the presentations, please submit them in the Q&A function in the toolbar. Um, I've got a couple of colleagues joining us today, Joe and Craig. They are going to be monitoring that for us, and we'll take all of the questions at the end of the presentations. Um, we want to make sure that we answer your questions, but um, we want to have a, a good conversation uh, to give you some prompts to, to consider. Um, surveys will be sent to your teachers. Um, please make sure that when you're done watching this presentation today that um, you go to that survey link. Your feedback is really important for us. Um, and with that, I think we can get started. Um, Sarah Plug is the sow farm manager at Dyke Heist Farms, which is in Allegan County. Welcome, Sarah. Oh, I think I've got you on mute. Let's see. There you go. Hi, Hi. good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, if you have your screen to share, anything that you want, um, visuals, uh, go ahead and launch those whenever you need to. Perfect. And um, just, you know, real quick, introduce yourself, um, give an overview of what Dyke Heist Farms is, um, the kind of agriculture work that you are involved in there, and, and maybe um, how, how you came to be in that role. Sure. Um, well, my name is Sarah Plug. Um, I am a sow farm manager at Dyke Heist Farms. Um, just an overview of what Dyke Heist Farms is. Um, we have 18,000 sows. Um, they are located in all different barns uh, in the Holland Zealand area. Um, we have six different uh, commercial farms. Um, they all have different names. Um, at each location, they have between uh, 2,600 to 2,800 uh, sows at each farm. Um, and like average weekly, we breed 150 uh, pigs each week. We farrow 135 litters each week. Um, and then each week we, you'll see about 1400 piglets born. Um, on each farm, we have about nine to 12 employees uh, running those locations with one sow farm manager. Um, and the farms run uh, 365 days a year. Um, how I became working at Dyke Heist Farms, um, I was working in an office actually. Um, I was looking for part-time work and I started working at the sow farms on the weekends. Um, and I was working three jobs. I worked two office jobs and then I worked in the sow farms on the weekends and people would tell me, it's crazy, you work three jobs, which one do you like the most? And I said, I like my weekend job working with the pigs. And so then I decided to go full time at Dyke Heist. And within a matter of six months, I was an assistant manager. And within a year, I was running a sow farm. So when you were in high school, did you did you grow up on a farm? Like, was this this a career path that you had seen for yourself growing up? Um, or did you have different things in mind? Um, I mean, my dad owns, um, he has his own farm. He does quality hay. Um, so he does harvest every year. Um, so I grew up like driving tractors, um, throwing hay every season, but um, I never took on like my dad's business. I was very driven to do something on my own, same with my brother and sister. Um, when I was in high school, I played soccer. Um, I thought I was gonna like grow up and be the world's best soccer player. <laughs> that didn't work out for me <laughs> when I graduated. Um, so I just started working. I, I got a job working at Planet Fitness 
and I became the manager at Planet Fitness within six months of working there. Then I started working at an engineering company and I started managing the shipping department there. I really just, um, if I saw an opportunity or something that I wanted to learn, I just, I tried it out. Even if I didn't know anything about it, like pigs knew nothing about it, but it was a weekend opportunity. It, you know, I had time, so I just tried it, learned it, liked it and grew in the company. Awesome. That's great. Um, so you, you mentioned obviously farms, um, animals, they're there all year round, um, yes. 365 days. So what is a, what's a typical day look like for you, um, from, you know, the time that you get there, you know, what are, what are the typical tasks, things that you're doing in that role? Um, so we usually arrive at the farm, um, 6 AM, um, sometimes with trucking, we arrive around five, but between five and 6 AM. Um, first thing always is feeding the animals. So my farm is a 2,500 head farm, which means there's 2,500 mama sows. So um, that could be female sows that are pregnant, female gilts that are waiting to be bred, um, female sows or gilts um, that are currently lactating, uh, small piglets, big piglets, um, but total on farm 2,500 female pigs that need to be fed every morning and they are hungry at 6 a.m. So the first thing we do is we go in and we feed um, 2,500 pigs. That takes uh, for a team of between nine to 12 people about three and a half hours to observe every single animal, feed every single animal, and give water to every single animal. Um, after that, we break into many different individual specific tasks that are done on farm every single day that would be um, heat checking and taking care of piglets, treating sick animals, um, checking ventilation, um, and caring, doing the other care side of being an animal caretaker. Got it. So, you know, are there, are there myths about this occupation? Are there things that you see on TV, of, you know, about farming particularly that you just, you know, they just get under your skin because you, you know what it's actually like to be in the job? Yeah, I think a lot of people, if you say, well, I, I work on a, on a pig farm, oh, you know, they'll say, oh, so you slaughter the pigs there. Or, no, we don't do that. Our, our whole job is to care for the pigs, to keep them alive and give them the best life. That our job is not, not, to, um, not to see the end for them. Our job is to care for them and give them the best life. Um, and some other people think, you know, it's a, it's a petting zoo and all we do all day is pet pigs. And no, we are feeding pigs and treating sick pigs and, we are monitoring so much information like ventilation and um, how many pigs per sow each uh, sow is producing and uh, the percentage of weight that they gain between their pregnancies and how much they lose after they give birth to their piglets. And it's incredible the amount of information that we collect in one day. Um, and people just think we pet pigs all day. There's some technologies, there's some data tracking, you know, you're, you're using a computer throughout the day and, and keeping track of all of those things. Yes, yes, it's unbelievable the amount of information that we write down, sometimes on a piece of paper or wherever we can write down information, we're writing stuff down, we're tracking everything we can on a daily basis. So what do you like most about your job? Um, I like that I do not have a schedule for myself. I walk in to work every day and I do not have, um, I don't schedule myself for anything, but I am busy 12 hours a day. Very, I don't sit down. I, I am very, very busy. I never know what the day is going to bring, what the pigs are going to tell me, what the people are going to bring me. And 
I, I love that part of my job. What do you like least about it then? That's a good question. Um, you know, I guess maybe working on Christmas, <laughs> working. <laughs> I, I work 365 days a year. Uh, I'm also, I'm on call 365 days a year uh, when there's a ventilation problem at 2 a.m. My phone goes off and to the farm I go. So I'm, I'm on call 365 days a year. I'm always thinking about pigs. And that's a big responsibility. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, so if there's there's students today watching that are, you know, considering careers in, in agribusiness, um, yes. Do you have any advice for, for students on, you know, what they should focus on, what skills they should be working on that could help them follow a similar career path to yours? I would say in the summertime, apply to, to work at the farm and, and see um, if you like it. I mean, we have uh, new technology now where we're using phones for tracking data. I mean, I know kids like to be on phones. So now in the cell farms, we track all of our data um, using a cell phone. And I need kids to help me to use that cell phone because <laughs> I'm so used to using paper to, to track all my data. And, and now the industry is changing so fast to be using technology and these old farmers, including me, I, I'm 28 years old, but I still, I'm still behind in technology because it's changing so fast and I can't keep up because I'm in the South Farm all day. I, I don't use computers very much. I don't use my phone because one, I don't have service in the South Farm and I can't keep up. So these kids, if you come into a South Farm, you are valuable just by knowing how to use your cell phone. Is, that is great to hear that, you know, that technology is all coming into play and, and that there are, there are opportunities just to be able to utilize things that, that you're already doing on a daily basis can, can make an impact day yes. one on, on a job at Dyke Heist Farms. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate you sharing um, everything with us today. A reminder to the students, if you have any questions for Sarah, um, put them in the Q&A function on your toolbar. We will get to those at the end. Um, and next, we are going to be hearing from Simon Kronk. He is with the Muskegon Area Conservation District and is a MEEP technician. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Simon. Um, same as Sarah, if you've got anything on your um, screen, any presentation that you'd like to share, Go ahead and you know turn that on while we have our conversation, but welcome this morning. Thank you, Carrie. Again, my name is Simon Kronk. I serve Muskegon and Nuego County Conservation Districts as the MEEP technician. So <clears throat> MEEP is Michigan Agricultural Environmental Assurance Program. And I have a couple pictures to maybe put some recognition to a sign you've seen out in the countryside. Um, I will share my screen and hopefully this can be fluid. Oh boy. My apologies. Share this screen. Okay. Okay. Can you see that? Sure can. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, sharing this screen so this this is our logo um, and we promote sustainable agriculture uh, primarily looking at water quality on the farm nutrient management soil health um, overall pesticide herbicide storage fuel containment um, things to safeguard well well heads um, surface waters nearby um, and promotion of reduced tillage, um, cover crops are, are new. We always want to see um, folks trying to keep a living root on the soil at all times throughout the, uh, throughout the year to hold on to the soil, prevent erosion um, and nutrients leaching into nearby watersheds. So um, this is a, a Christmas tree nursery actually. 
you're not farming, you're supporting farmers. And correct, I'm an doing. advocate uh, for best management practices. So okay. um, I hope to one day get into farming myself. Um, I did not grow up on a farm, so um, it has had a learning curve to um, to get to know the processes. Hearing from Sarah was very interesting. I have not been on an operation of that size, um, primarily with my location, um, but learning dairy dairy farms has been uh, been a task for me, um, and just promoting best management and act actively um, commending folks that are going above and beyond, and they're on their management and doing you know the 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 record keeping that Sarah mentioned um, is is huge. So data, um, new technology, I, I can't keep up myself. And uh, there's some pretty, pretty neat technology out there that folks can track um, their, their records and their, their applications throughout the year. So, um, yep, technology. Yeah, so you, you didn't grow up in farming and, and you're doing this now. When did you decide to pursue a career in this field? How did that, how did that look for you? Yeah, um, there's, there's another picture. Um, this is at a local urban, urban ag farm in Muskegon. But um, in college, I, I chose to take a, a steep turn out of uh, engineering and I went into environmental biology loved growing plants, loved the natural world, forestry, um, things like that. And I had an internship requirement and there was a job um, with uh, Pioneer Seed Corn. And it was a, a large, large um, agricultural company. And um, I thought, wow, I'll, I'll try that, right? You know, any opportunity that presents itself, I've, I've tried to capitalize on and, and just and learn you learn on the job ultimately. Um, you know, I like to say college or, or greater education creates or establishes responsibility in you, but the as for work ethic and take take the opportunity um, and go for it. So I did that throughout the summer, got on the farms um, and promoted seed corn. Uh, and then went after graduation it was a great i worked on that job three years and then after graduation i was like i'm gonna go into forestry um and got a job with michigan state in a, a laboratory a silviculture laboratory um and it was all field work for three summers in the up and northern lower peninsula and got to um, be out in some of the most beautiful northern hardwood stands in Michigan all day, every day, um, taking data, identifying seedlings, and taking uh, measurements for timber production. So, um, and then I chose to move back to my neighborhood where I grew up and serve my community the best I could, or make it, make try to make an impact in my community and. Uh, I joined the conservation district um, as a sustainable agriculture technician promoting the meat program. And I get to be involved in a lot of really cool conservation projects, um, watershed projects to forestry projects to egg to promoting um, environmental verifications on farms. Um, yeah, there's days are days are very, very a lot. So, so what, what does a typical, I know you, you know, you say that the days are varied, but is there yeah. a, um, is there a typical flow to what a day would look like or, you know, an example day that would shed some more light? Sure. Sure. I like to, um, you know, we work, I work 80 to 90 hours of, um, every, every two weeks. So it's not, um, as strenuous as true farm farming occupation, but, uh, it's more of a consulting job. So. Um, I will come into the office in the morning, get, I set my own schedule, um, which does cause its own stresses, um, you know, trying to keep, stay busy, have site visits, and also um, balance the office communications with field visits and con 
consultation. So, um, you know, I get interest from a farm um, and I schedule a site visit. I go out, um, start with one conversation. We kind of do a walkabout. And from there, we get into some more technical visits or technical um, documents that I provide um, <clears throat> and gather as much information, animal numbers, cropping rotations, um, acreage, uh, a lot of mapping, um, a lot of GIS work. If, um, if folks are familiar out there, I think it's an excellent, excellent path. Um, and I wish my skills were stronger, but uh, I do enjoy mapping. So um, a lot of that after I, after I do an initial site visit and um, from there it can be, I can get a call for a forest, forest pest, um, gypsy moths in this area. I'm sure maybe some folks have heard um, those calls pick up and um, this time of year and it can be, it's a consult consulting job to share resources that are available um, here in the counties. So oh, what are your, your perceptions on um, a, the job outlook for this career? Um, in each of the, the counties has their own conservation district. Is there just one person working on that or is there a myriad of consultants out in the field doing this work? Sure, I, I do think the job market is strong um, at conservation districts. Um, they often are a foot in the door for natural resource management. So um, as my role meet technician, um, there is only one per county generally. I, I serve two counties. So um, it is a limited um, pool um, throughout the state. However, the last two years we have had 50% turnover. So um, with, with that being said, there's, there's a lot of opportunities that um, come up at your local conservation district on top of seasonal employees that, um, that may, may work in a wa on watershed projects that are stream restoration or bank established reestablishment tree planting projects. Um, the list goes on and, and at and at conservation districts, they're often grant funded. So projects can come in, um, monies can come in and you'd be you could be employed seasonally um, with with the aspiration to get a full-time position at, at that district. Um, so forestry, um, there's generally like five programs that conservation districts offer. Um, the MEAP program, sustainable agriculture, there's FAP, which is forestry assistance program. Um, that's similar to MEAP, but on the forest aspect, there is Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, that is a federal farm agency and conservation agency. Um, an excellent career, career path. Um, and that does take a soil science degree. Um, and then there are directors and seasonal employees that kind of help and assist um, staff members. Well, Thera had mentioned um, opportunities for students to, to get involved in the farms for summer work. Um, you mentioned seasonal opportunities a couple of different times. Would those be open to high school students? Absolutely. Um, we've actually entertained um, a couple. We had some snags during COVID, um, but we were hoping to get a local, our local FFA chapter member um, and some of the ag vocational ag science groups. Um, I go, I frequent those classrooms and present and try to partner with them on some in the field education. So um, vocational ag science um, and, and, and ultimately open to high school students to job shadow. Um, I myself in high school shadowed in this exact office um, when I was 16 years old. So, and I never, and at that time I enjoyed it, but it wasn't, it didn't seem like, it seemed more clerical or more paperwork than I ever thought I would want to do. Things have changed here and lo and behold, I'm, I'm here. So I never, never would have thought in a million years. Well, 
Oh. Yeah. So advice for, for people who are, are considering, you know, I know there's a lot of people who are interested in, um, in natural resource management and that sustainability piece, um, you know, job shadows, you know, programs in school, things that you would advise them to, to look into now so that they can pursue a career in this field. Yes. Um, I would, you know, starting job shadowing can be difficult to get into. Um, you know, with our workloads, but I would encourage encourage anyone who is interested to call your local conservation district um, or send an email to the director or office administrator. Um, volunteer. I think that was some when I was working jobs that I didn't love or you know felt downtrodden. Um, volunteering helped me. Um, whether that was planting trees or helping with native plant sale. Um, and, you know, you spend a half a day on a Saturday and you get to meet all the staff and share your knowledge or just your, just your passion and interest in it, um, doors open. And um, so volunteer your time if you, if you like to be outdoors and, and, and get, get some, you know, Plant some trees and, and be in the water, wear waders. I get, I'm going to be in my waders tomorrow all day. So it'll be a different day. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate all of the information that you've shared with us today. Um, students, if you have any questions for Simon, um, add them in that Q&A bar. We will get to those um, in just a few minutes after we have um, an opportunity to hear from Zenobia. Uh, Zenobia Taylor Weiss is the owner of Cellar Door Preserves in Grand Rapids. Um, she's an entrepreneur and started this food processing business about six years ago, I believe. Um, thanks for being here, Zenobia, today. Um, like Sarah and Simon, if you need to share your screen, go ahead and do that while we chat. Sure, yeah, let me try to do that. Yeah. And then once you get it up and running, if you um, have a, you know, anything that you want to share, a quick overview on, on Cellar Door Preserves, um, you know, anything you'd like to share about how, how you came to be a food entrepreneur, we'd love to, love to learn. Yeah, yeah. So my business is called Cellar Door Preserves. We make artisan um, fruit preserves and cocktail fruit. So like jams, spreads, um, cocktail fruit is fruit in fruit syrup. Um, Right now we use all Michigan fruit in our products, which is really cool. Um, yeah, so I, my story is I, it started as a hobby of mine that turned into a business. Um, I started it, I think I maybe have a picture here. There's me, um, at my, in my first kitchen, um, I used a shared used kitchen. Um, there's also called incubator kitchens. Um, so you rent out time in the kitchen and lots of other businesses use it as well. Um, it's a really great way to start a food business. Um, so I was there for two and a half years and then I moved into my own facility, which I don't know, maybe I have, I think that picture on the right, that's, um, that's some of us in, in our, our kitchen now that's just ours, which is really nice. Um, yeah, so we, um, we sell our products, um, all over the country. We're in over 200 stores nationwide. Um, I think the farthest away we are is Alaska, which is pretty cool that people are eating Michigan fruit there. Um, and yeah, we also do, um, we do private labels for companies. So if someone wants, um, like a restaurant, let's say, wants to sell jam with their name on it, but they don't really want to go through the whole process of making it, um, we will do that and they'll put their label or a co-branded label, something like that. Um, I currently have, well, it's my, my employees have expanded now because it's market season. So I have 10 employees now. I usually am around six, um, but we sell at farmer's markets. So um, we always bump up a little bit in the summertime for that. So when you were in high school, you, you know, sat around and dreamed of, of owning a, a preserves company or was there a different path for you? Yeah, very much not. Um, I didn't even know about canning in high school, really. Um, it was like something that grandmas did, I thought. Um, so yeah, in high school, I actually was interested in graphic design, um, which is pertinent because the picture of the labels on the left, those are some of our labels. And I do actually design all of our labels. So it is kind of a 
a fun thing that I wanted to do in high school that I never actually thought I would get to do. And it is a little part of my job now. Um, but no, I, um, in high school and in college, I really wanted to, um, my goal was to work in the nonprofit sector, um, helping people. And I did, I actually did do that for almost a decade um, before I started my business. And then in the early stages of my business while I was still building it up, um, which was great. And I learned a lot of skills through that, but um, no, I never imagined myself in, uh, as a business owner. Sure. So what, what's a typical day look like for you? What are the hours that you work? Does it vary or is it pretty, pretty set? Um, it varies a bit. It's, it's more set now. When I was in the shared use kitchen, it was a lot more chaotic because you're kind of at the whim of when this, the kitchen is free. Um, now that we have our own space, we can really just, um, set our own hours, which is, which is really wonderful. Um, I, I tend, these days I tend to work about 40 hours a week. Um, but then some weeks will be a lot more if I have an, an event or just like we have a huge order that comes in something like that. Um, my role now is much more of kind of overseeing everything. So I, um, I have a production manager, Heidi, she's, um, she's on the right in that photo, who is in charge of the kitchen and who kind of runs things there with some kitchen assistants. So I will help out in the kitchen when they need my help, um, but I'm not day-to-day -day making jam. I'm more, um, much more of like an office job. So I'm talking with customers, I'm writing invoices, I'm um, coordinating my employees, I'm applying for farmer's markets, I'm contacting stores, um, making sure that all of our purchase orders are correct and everything's just kind of running smoothly. So personal qualities that it would take to, um to become a food entrepreneur, to start your own business and, and do something um, similar to what you have done? Um, I think the biggest quality is going to be determination. I think um, when you first start, like food businesses are hard to start. Um, people try to start them all the time and they fail a lot. Um, and one of the best and coolest things about working in a shared kitchen is that I have met and know a lot of other food entrepreneurs and um, I have seen lots of other people who are super inspiring and I've learned a lot from and I've also seen a lot of people who don't realize how hard it is and can't make it because of that. Um, I think the first few years are tough uh, and you will work, you know, I work 40 hours a week now. That's That wasn't true when I was first starting the business. Um, you will have to go through some years of of hard work and um, not bringing in a lot of money. And um, so I think like being, being able to like have in your mind, like a three or five year goal and being able to stick with your business throughout that um, is probably gonna be one of the best things you can do um, for it. Sure. So did you make mistakes along the way? Um, you know, things that you you really learned from that somebody following behind you could could take from your experience and and, and maybe not have that, um, <laughs> you know, that that sidetrack happen. Sure. I mean, I've made plenty of mistakes um, in my business. I've and uh, you know, I've learned from all of them. So in a way, I don't regret them. Um, I think my biggest advice to someone starting a food business, um, practical advice that I definitely didn't take and I wish I had is to start with a small product line and expand from there. Um, it's a lot easier to add on a new product every now and then than to start with a big line and then have to, and then realize that maybe you don't have the capacity to produce all of those things and then have to get rid of a flavor that a lot of people love. Um, so it's, yeah, I would just say start with like a core small group of products um and you could always expand from there sure. um so what do you what do you love most about being a food entrepreneur um well i love being my own boss um and i really love well there's several things so uh being in the food world and industry is so fun everybody who works in food is just a blast um so you always get you know fun industry gatherings and cool people. Um, 
and then uh, what drew me to the business was was the food aspect that was what I was passionate about but then I through starting this business learned that I actually do like um, owning a business and I like entrepreneurship um, and I was able to to find new skills myself I didn't know I had like I kind of like doing our accounting work which I always was like horrible in math and hated it so much um and so yeah it's one of those things of like oh once you start caring about it and it matters to you then then it makes sense and you like it so um yeah I just every day is a little bit different and that's something I really love great um anything that you would um, you know, you're just waiting to see you grow a little bit more that you can hire somebody to take something off your hands, like your least favorite aspects that, um, that, that happen too frequently for you. <laughs> um, right now that's, uh, that's packing boxes. I'm, I'm doing that right now. So we send, um, you know, I said, we're in over 200 stores. We do a lot of those are pretty small orders that we just literally like send out via UPS, um, and then we have our online store and we're on a couple of other big online platforms. And so just always like packing boxes of jam to send out and I don't mind doing it, but um, it's a time suck and it's like, not, not yet, but soon it'll be time to hire someone else for that. And that will be really nice for me. <laughs> Absolutely. And, it, and that'll show that your business is growing, right? When you mm -hmm. get to that point. So, Yeah. Um, any, any solid advice if, um, you know, somebody, somebody is interested in, um, in starting a business, you know, they, they love cooking, they've got that special recipe that they like to make. Um, what, what advice would you give for somebody that, you know, maybe today is the first day that it, it occurred to them that they could become a food entrepreneur because they've heard from you. Um, my best advice would be to, tell everybody and talk about it to everybody you know. Um, there is a wealth of information out there and you never know like who has a connection or uh, people, people really are surprising and you don't always know like the knowledge somebody has. So I would say just start telling people. Um, my second advice would be to um, reach out to the MSU Product Center. Um, they're a really wonderful resource for food entrepreneurs in Michigan. Um, and it's completely free if you live here. Um, yeah, and then if, and then talk to, like go to the farmer's market, talk to people who are selling food there. Um, you can talk to me. I'm, I always love talking to people who wanna start a food business. I have plenty of things, to, <laughs> plenty of advice to dispense, whether or not it's helpful, I don't know. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much for, um, for being here today, for sharing. Um, I'm going to um, see if there were any questions that have came in. Um, Craig, Joe, any, any questions for the panel? Yep, a couple of questions in the chat that we'll get started with, and then it might have a, a question for everyone as well. So the first one um, is for Simon uh, specifically. Um, do you have a set schedule uh, in which, for which like, farms you visit or, or areas that you visit um, on a regular basis? I don't have a set schedule. Um, it is generally um, I kind of roll with it. I, I like to get in on Mondays. I like to schedule about 10 days out, um, whether that being office time, office half days to catch up on communications um, with average about three farm visits um, a week. Um, that's about my capacity um, to to be able to follow up. Um, so that's kind of my goal to get about three farm visits, and they usually are about a half day visit, all said and done with with travel and and time on the farm. So, um, yeah, the creation of my own schedule was extremely, you know, free. To, it was freeing, and and flex and the flexibility is is incredible. Um, but it also can be can be stressful when you over when you double book or you're already a month scheduled out and you can't make it to something that came that came up um, short notice and is it a required training or a a very really good conference or um, networking event. So it can be it can be stressful to not have that set that set schedule. So. 
couple of questions for Sarah. Um, for, first, maybe just um, go in a little more detail. When, when you talk about sows, go into detail what you mean. I think some, oh, myself including, yes. um, aren't exactly sure uh, uh, what, what that means. And then, um, and then beyond that, the first question I think that you can answer beyond that would just be what, you know, what kind of goes into the food that they eat? I'm sure it's not just something that's simple. So what kind of what goes into that process of making sure that they're eating good food and that you're monitoring that? Um, so, a uh, gilt is a virgin female pig. Um, so, we receive um, on the farm when we receive our virgin um, gilt, those are pigs that have never had a, uh, never had baby pigs. If they are first time mommies. Um, sows are pigs that have had at least one litter. When a pig has had one litter, she is now a sow. When she has never had a litter, a litter, which is piglets, um, she is a gilt. So we, we uh, the terminology is gilt, sow, pigs, boar, boar is a, is a boy pig. Um, as for the, the diet of our pigs, um, we have an actual um, nutritionist who is in charge of what goes into our feed um, in all of our different sow farms. Um, some of our sow farms run a little bit of a different nutrition diet um, than what my farm runs. Um, I'm not in charge of that, thank goodness. That's one less thing I have to be in charge of. Um, but if anything is, is wrong, if we are having a lot of pigs that are thin, a lot of pigs that are fat, if a lot of pigs are getting sick, like the first question is, has someone talked to the nutritionist? Um, we also have a veterinarian that visits the farm monthly um, who sees every single pig on farm every 30 days. Um, I'm also in contact with that veterinarian weekly hey, this is what I'm seeing, I'm concerned about this, um, and at which time we can make um, adjustments to the nutrition that the pigs are eating. Uh, they mostly eat corn, um, but we've also done wheat uh, previously. Pigs will eat anything mostly, but <laughs> corn and wheat is what they eat here at Dyke Heiss. Thanks. Um I'm going to go back to Simon for one question, then over to Zenobia. Simon, what what from your background makes you want to work with uh, far, farms uh, within agriculture? What really drives you towards that type of work? Yeah, great question. Um, I enjoy the communication um, and the knowledge I gain from farmers. I think they um, have a lot to share. And if you give them an open mind and, and maybe a different perspective, I like to say I'm, um, this is a, it's a voluntary program and I have some cost share funds to help them tidy up their farm, so to speak. So I do have a, it's a good place to be. Um, they're not pressured to work with me. Um, I'm non-regulatory, so I can kind of go out and and just observe some of, you know, maybe some, they got, you know, drainage problems or they got, you know, a lot, they're struggling with a lot of water near the animal barns and just some drainage solutions, um, concrete pads um, for storage and, and clean things up. Um, just giving them a subjective or subjective, uh, just a, a, a not open mind approach to, um, bettering their their farm and uh and i learn a lot every day some different animal alpacas sheep cows pigs um got beefalo i was at a beefalo farm recently which is a hybrid um uh, wild buffalo with um a beef cow i believe holstein or well um but um <clears throat> so I learn a lot every day and I appreciate their time and their commitment to raising the food food that we uh, that we eat every day. So. Great. Uh, there's gonna be a couple of questions for you. Um, I think what one um, 
I, I'm interested in as well. Do you have a particular jam that your company makes that's your favorite? Um, and then uh, generally, um, how, how much do they sell for? And then I think maybe a good business application would be kind of how, you know, if, you, if you're able to share how much you make it for um, and then like shipping costs and how much you're actually be able to make on it, you know, kind of talk about the business aspect behind uh, making your jams and selling it. Sure, yeah. Um, so uh, to answer your first question, um, they're all my favorite, but um, <laughs> I think one of the most interesting and one of our most popular flavors that we make is um, our tomato jam with red pepper. Um, it's actually based on an old fashioned recipe that I found in a really old cookbook um, and I kind of modernized it a little bit, but um, I know it might sound really weird, but it's super delicious and I really like it with cheese. Um, so for cost stuff, um, we are frankly in the middle of raising our prices because all of our costs are going up massively right now, um, as everyone's are. So um, when I first started, all the jams were $12 a jar. Um, now our products range between $12 and $16 a jar. Our cocktail fruit is $16. Um, and then some of our more specialty jams are $13, $14. And then the ones we can still afford are 12 for now, but probably will have to go up. Um, so the way, so we typically wholesale our jams um, for about 50% of what their retail value is. So if, a, if we sell a jam to the end consumer for $12, um, we would wholesale it for $6. Um, we, depending on the flavor, it would cost us probably three to four dollars a jar to make that jam. Um, and so we would be making, you know, two or three dollars profit um, on a wholesale jar of jam. Um, so obviously if we if we're selling it to the end consumer for twelve dollars, we're making a lot more on that, but there's a lot more work that goes into selling it to an end consumer. Um, we have to do our own marketing or pay someone to go sell it. Um, so that's kind of the the basics of pricing structure. Awesome, thanks. Sarah, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Um, it's kind of a, if you have the answer, that's great. It's kind of a cost question as well. But first, so another two-parter. First, um, kind of a combo. Do you name the pigs? And I mean, do you have like favorite pigs or they're but there's yes. certain pigs that are like, you know, yes. they're better than other ones, right? Better yes. personality. Yes. Okay. Um, and, then, and then do you, I mean, through that life cycle of, of, uh, of the sows and the pigs, um, you know, how much does it usually cost to, to, to raise the pigs over their lifetime? I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> I, I truly don't. Um, I'm sure my boss knows that question because I am grilled um monthly and in meetings to drive the cost down you know with um we have protocols that are set in place and those protocols are set in place for cost management so feeding a certain number of pounds of feed every day feed is the most expensive cost to the farm so any kind of feed wastage so sometimes we have feed spills you know we, somebody wasn't paying attention you can easily put one ton of feed into a barn just on the on the floor like somebody isn't paying attention and you have a broken feed line or you know something happens and you can run one ton of feed just in the middle of a pen or whatever and the cleanup process for that is it's not gonna you know i'm not gonna be able to put that back into um all the tiny boxes as you saw in some of my photos so um things like uh you know paying attention making sure that uh things are running properly that uh maintenance things are happening with feed boxes feed motors um treating sows so uh sow death loss you know if if the pigs stay living that's gonna you know we make money on those pigs eventually at the end so if you keep them living and producing piglets um that's a cost to the farm. Um, so I don't actually know how much we spend um, in each pig, but by following our proper protocols, 
we are gonna give the pig the best life, um, but not spend um, a bunch of money in each piglet. But um, really our focus on the farm is just taking care of pigs. We don't, we don't count dollars at the farm. We just, we raise pigs. That's all we, all we focus on. Fantastic. Um, I'm gonna kind of do a, a, a final question for everyone, just kind of to wrap it up. Um, based on the questions here. So we'll start with, um, and it kind of mirrors some of the questions I think we had before, but um, I'll, I'll just kind of go around and we'll start with, um, what would you say is one of the more frustrating parts of your job and then wrap it up, we'll wrap it up on a high note and a, and a positive thing um, in terms of what do you feel like is your, what, what, is, what is the thing that keeps you coming back every single day? So um, Simon, why don't we start with that? Just talk about a little bit on, hey, this is something that kind of frustrates me, but this is what keeps me back coming every day. Okay, frustrating uh, part of my job. Um, emails and scheduling. Uh, no. it's, it's tough to manage when, um, when you have a lot of channels open um, and a lot of projects um, at various stages. Um, grant writing can be, uh, grant deadlines can be a burden. Um, so um, I, I think I pride myself in face-to-face -face com communication and on the phone, but when I have to translate my thoughts and my language into words and email, I, I don't love it. So, um, but I try my best. And then, and then which part, uh, just to wrap it up on a, on a high note, what, and then what's, what's that one thing that you say, this, this keeps me happy. This keeps me coming back, um, each and every day. I love going out to a farm. I love getting a tour of someone's property and seeing the animals they raise, how they raise them, and then hopefully getting to go out into the forest and talk about the, the, the health, the, the species, the um, just overall aesthetics and, and ways to manage. I, I ultimately love manage, helping folks manage their land or, or, or steer them in the right direction um, in constant stewardship. Zenobia, how about you? Yeah, so the answer um, is the same for both for me. Um, it's my customers. So uh, my customers can be very infuriating. I, they, I, I have people who will ask really weird questions like, do you have any sugar-free jam? And I'm like, literally fruit has sugar in it. It's impossible. Um, <laughs> and, you know, someone will send me an email like, oh, this jam like wasn't exactly the same consistency as the last time I got it. And like it's small batches. And I could go on and on and on about all of the really annoying things that have been said to me by customers. Um, but also um, my customers are what keep, keeps me coming back. I, you know, having someone taste my jam and say, like, this tastes like the jam my grandma used to make, and I haven't had anything like it since she passed away. Or we just had someone use our jam for a gender reveal for their baby. Or, um, yeah, just, just you know, people share it on Instagram, like, our, our jam and their family celebrations. That's just, like, one of the really coolest things in the world. Um, yeah, and it makes putting up with all the annoying questions worth it. <laughs> Very cool. I think I think we have a, a jar of the, your jam in the fridge right now. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a staple. All right, Sarah, how about you? Uh, one frustrating uh, thing, and then uh, ultimately, what keeps you coming back? Um, I would say what's frustrating would be people not showing up for work. Um, we have an extremely um, dedicating job uh, to the animals. 365 days a year, holidays, weekends. Um, we have pigs to feed every single day. Um, and if someone is not dedicated to the farm and they don't show up for work, it lets the whole team down and it lets the pig down. Um, so, but I have an amazing team. Um, so I'm really grateful for that, but I have been through some, some teams. So, but now I'm, I'm, very grateful for the people that I have and who I work with. Um, and what do I like most? I, I would say the pigs. 
they keep me coming back. They're my second family. I love every single one of them. Very cool. All right, well, thank you. Thank you all. I'm gonna pass it back to Carrie to kind of wrap things up. There may be, if there was a question that wasn't answered, we'll send it off to Carrie and see if we can't get a written answer sitting out. Um, but I'll send it back to Carrie to uh, finalize the session. Oh, thank you. Those are those are great questions. Um, I, I loved hearing the answers to them. So um, we hope you enjoyed hearing from the, the career guides today. Um, thank you to all the students for being here. Thank you especially to the career guides for sharing your stories, your, your career paths, your knowledge. Um, and to all the students, um, please remember to complete that survey once, once you receive that link. Um, if you want to watch this again um, or see any of the other webinars that are taking place, because we do have other industries that are being represented, um, head to the My Career Quest YouTube channel. Um, and this webinar will be available on that YouTube channel very soon. Um, thanks again, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Um, thank you so much. <laughs>